it is the third Sunday of June. And you know what that means? Fellowship meal. Well, it also means Father's Day. You know, that was only codified as a national holiday in 72. Apparently, Richard Milhouse Nixon did something pretty good. So I want to address specifically fathers this morning, but of course this has application for all of us. We all had a father. Some of us are fathers. Some of you will be fathers, believe it or not. Now that takes some faith. I want to read from Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Now of course we could begin we could begin way back in in chapter 5, but I want to specifically concentrate on verse 4. So I'm, I'm going to read 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. A few years ago, I was cutting firewood over on the west side of the woods. By all aggregate, it's the sticks. No one around. There's no power lines. And, and uh, all of a sudden, I heard one voice come out of the distance. Is that oak I smell? Well, it was a guy I knew. He was taking a walk. And, and we talked for a while. He was kind of keeping me from my work. And uh, all of a sudden, he said... I'm sorry. Uh, I keep thinking I'm talking to Ralph. Who are you again? <laughs> well, he's talking about my dad, you know. Yeah, that's for, for me, that'd be high praise, you know. But I don't just look like him. I walk like him, talk like him. According to Bob Long, I teach like him. The glasses are down here instead of up here. In fact, my poor daughter, Hannah, well, forget Aaron. You know, we homeschooled our kids, so he took a job at the grocery store, and people would say, oh, you must be Tim Bushong's son. You know, never never been in, you know, elementary, junior high. They just knew. But even worse is our daughter, Hannah, 11 years old. Heidi took her to the library, and as they're leaving, someone said, oh, you must be Tim Bushong's daughter. Can you imagine? 11-year-old girl, you look like your dad. But it gets worse. Wait, there's more. Jonas, your mom, Jill, said, oh, no, Elise looks like Hannah, and Hannah looks like you. So now I have a granddaughter that looks like me. Oh, the poor thing. Well, the fact is, I am a father. As a father, it's one word that would describe my existence. It begins with the letter R and ends in bull. It's responsible. I was responsible for my household. There's a reason that the household is the proving ground for pastoral ministry as well. I need to lead and serve my family even now that I'm a grandfather. And I've raised kids that are grown up and now their own households, right? And it keeps going and going and God's good timing as, as Matt told us. Earlier, how do we fight fractured families? By having solid families, by continuing God's good process. Now, there's a word that describes this, and you'll see in the title of the sermon, a blessed patriarchy. That last word would get you kicked out of some decent churches, by the way, because they want to use a different word for it rather than patriarchy. What is that word, anyone? That's too many syllables. Complementarianism. But right, those categories have been popularized. The other one is egalitarianism. So to better understand, let's take the suffix Arianism, not the heresy, but the suffix, out of the word so we can figure out what it is that people are talking about. Well, first we have on the one side, egal, which is the French for equal, egalitarian, and then the other one is complement or complementary, to fit together. So first of all, this 
this position of egalitarianism seems to be where our convention is headed more and more. But the broadest meaning is that all people are inherently equal and ought to be treated as such. Now, do we have any problem with that? I hope not. All people are created equal, bearing the image of God, and should be treated equally. Well, when it's used as a doctrinal term in Christianity, it's a much narrower definition. And it means that God does not intend any distinctions between men and women in matters of spiritual or domestic leadership. So that's really what the word's talking about. And the question is, so what do you think of women pastors? That's really what it is. But it has to do even much more with how Ephesians lays out the model for the home. Remember, after Paul says, submit to one another out of love, the very next verse he turns and starts dealing with specific groups within the church, in the family. The first thing he says is, wives, what? Love your husbands? No. Wives have, a, have usually have an easy job, that, that emotional love. No, he says, wives, submit. Husbands love. Children obey. Fathers don't drive them up the wall, and slaves obey your masters. He's very specific. The second term, complementarianism, was popularized by John Piper and Wayne Grudem in their 1991 book, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. It's the teaching that masculinity and femininity are ordained by God and that they're a good thing and that men and women are created to complement each other. Nothing wrong with that, right? It's not just physical, but it's emotional, spiritual, in a, in a home. It teaches that the sex roles found in the Bible are purposeful distinctions. And when they are applied in the home and the church, they promote blessing to both men and women. And following these divinely ordained roles, the ministry of God's people and others will reach their God-given potential. Now, what's wrong with that? But did you catch, did you catch where these, these ordained distinctions are to be applied? It's true as far as it goes, but they intentionally left out one of the major spheres of human activity and authority. Remember, we talk about sphere sovereignty, as Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch theologian, said. It's the family, the church, and the civil realm. Or the, you would say, the workaday. But it's, it's basically these three spheres of authority that God ordains... This is why I don't like the term complementarianism. It takes God's ordained design for men and women and just relegates it to the church and to the family. And by the way, it doesn't cover enough bases. If, if you limit God's design to only two of the three spheres, then go ahead and draft my daughter to go fight on the front lines. That's the logic. Because there can't be any distinctions, right? Right? It's artificial, is my point. I want to use the word patriarchy. As soon as I say that, some people, the hairs on the back of their neck just stand up. Of course, since the left or the progressives like to control language, words, even traditional Christian patriarchy qualities like, like strength, courage, uh, tenacity, initiative, authority... These are now referred to as toxic qualities. Now here is the most, if you look up patriarchy without anything attached, you're going to get taken to Wikipedia. Here it is. Patriarchy is an institutionalized social system in which men dominate over others. Yeah. <laughs> but can also refer to dominance over women specifically and extend to a variety of manifestations in which men have social privilege to cause exploitation or oppression. Well, that's not good. We don't want that, do we? No, we don't. Absolutely not. If that were the definition, then run, Forrest, run. But no, that was a caricature, a distortion of what the word really means and what it really signifies. 
That's why I had the Ephesians chapter 3, 14, and 15 read. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Well, if you, if you know your Greek language, you know that that word family is the word patria. Does that sound familiar? Let's lift our hands and sing the Gloria Patria. Who are we glorifying? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. It's taken from the word potter, which is father. If you've seen the the film, O Brother, Where Art Thou? You know that uh, Mr. (laughs) McGill gets upset and says, I'm the powder familius. Right, he's frustrated with his family and wife and he's trying to assert his position and he says, I'm the powder familius, I'm the head of the household. Well, you don't get very far from <laughs> merely asserting your position. But it's father. It's, it really is, is from, from, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and earth derives its name, but we translate it family because it has to do with the household. Patriarchy is literally father rule, potter arco, arco being over or to rule. And this concept isn't some sociological construction, it's baked into God's creation. Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians, he says, for if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, teachers beyond imagining. Yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. And he goes on and tells them to imitate me in this way. Father. what? That's not just a father of a household or even a father in the church. And, and I want to commend, there's, there's a guy sitting here who in a way was a father to a whole lot of junior high boys, Larry Welsh. Your, your guidance, patience, instruction, you were a, in, in a way a father to us, setting us an example of being methodical, being organized, not writing in cursive. <laughs> I, still, I still can't very well. But there, there was a sense in which, like Paul is saying, Paul didn't literally have physical children, but he became a father. Fathers are indispensable. And we heard Psalm 103, just as a father has compassion, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. <clears throat> you see, feminists want to maintain that the distinctive roles that we naturally assume are products of the fall. In other words, they're not part of the design. They're part of the the crookedness. And that Christians should seek to undo these distinctions. Well, there's a huge problem with that logic. It denies what we were created for in the first place. Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Right there, there, there are purpose statements in that verse 218 it's not good for the man to be alone obviously look at that guy trying to make it on his own so i will make him a helper suitable the old king james a help meet for him and then that's become in in our culture a good wife is called a help meet well it's actually a helper meet for him or fit for him And then in verses 21 and 22, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. Right there at the very beginning, what is the purpose of all of this? It's that men are designed by God to go and conquer, and women are designed to help him in his conquering. 
Now that, that again, goes forward to after the fall and the curse and the woman's seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. But that dominion mandate is still in play. It's not abrogated because of anything else like sin or the cross. It's still there. We are to take godly dominion, exercise that under the lordship of Jesus. And here's the thing. You know as well as I do that our society right now is insane. There's a new term for it. Circus. Clown world. You know, you know what clown world is? Where it's just nuts. The monkeys are running the zoo. I just read it. Uh, forgive me, but I did go to Bongino Report this morning. A 66-year-old man who wanted to give blood was turned down because he refused to answer a question. You know what it was? Are you pregnant? (laughs) Now that's clown world. That's insane. It literally is insane. I I mean, I'm only 61, obviously a man. And if someone asked me if I was pregnant... I don't know if I'd want to answer either. That's a pretty stupid question, right? But we also live in a culture that part of this is it's being increasingly driven by what Doug Wilson called father hunger. As a, the primary result of, of absent dads or practically absent dads, we've witnessed huge, sharp increases in violence, crimes, gang, murder, sexual assault, robbery, our friend Vody Bauckham got thrown under the bus in 2014 for suggesting that the problems in East St. Louis, Ferguson primarily, were not due to systemic racism, but because all these crooks came from homes that had no daddy. And he was thrown under the bus. How dare you? You're not the right kind of black. Not for us anymore. That's why you don't see Vody in the SBC anymore. Here's just, here's just a sampling, okay? I'm not going to read the whole list. I've got a lot here. Associate Professor of Social Work at the University of British Columbia, Edward Kirk, wrote this regarding the absence of fathers. 85% of youth in prison have an absent father. 85%. He says, for children, the results of this are disastrous. Fatherless children struggle with abandonment, self-loathing, manifest abject hunger for males are susceptible to exploitation then, greater risk of suffering physical, emotional, sexual abuse, five times more likely to have experienced this with a hundred times higher risk of fatal abuse, a hundred, not a hundred percent, a hundred times more likely more psychosomatic illnesses. They tend to live four years less than if they had a daddy at home. Huge range of mental health problems, on and on and on it goes. It's just depressing. And not only this, but as a result, partially of this, we are utterly confused about gender and sex. That's why Matt Walsh has a YouTube presentation, What is a Woman?, And some of the answers, again, clown world. And I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis's famous quote from The Abolition of Man. He says, in a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chest, that means without, without courage, without honor, Men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors. We castrate and bid the geldings to be fruitful. Well, this is the state of affairs we're in. In that last book in the Old Testament, Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. What's the next part? Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. King James, a curse. 
We can draw this principle. When fathers and their children are alienated, all of society comes under the curse of God. It's chaos instead of pleasant order. It's insanity instead of rationality. It's strife instead of peace. Well, you may expect me to now apply these to the church, right? Same problems outside as in. Well, have we fared much better than our surrounding culture? Well, in a word, yes. Did you expect? <laughs> yes. Actually, yeah. Yeah. It's imperfect. And yes, we're way too worldly still. But in the main, yes, the gospel transforms lives, enables people. God's people to obey him in these areas. And the family, we know, is God's most fundamental building block for every other social group. And the Christian family is the foundational building block in advancing God's kingdom. Now, it's not the only block, but the church is made up of families. And in fact, one of the secular sociologists out there, Wilcox, argues that religious domesticate, religion domesticates men in such a way as to make them more responsive to the aspirations and needs of their immediate families. And in fact, church-going conservative Protestants have the lowest rates of child abuse, not the highest. The lowest of all the people groups were we're doing better than the pagans. Well, you're right for that. But yes, the scriptures are full and brimming with wisdom and practical, practical application regarding fathers and by extension, fathers and mothers, children in the family and fathers. Yes, indeed, that word applies. You are responsible for teaching these truths to your family and to your children. We know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fathers, we are responsible to raise godly sons, some who are sons who are capable and strong, not bullies and tyrants, self-assured and yet not arrogant, who are tender yet not spineless milksops, who are wise and not proud. And we're responsible to raise daughters who have self-respect without haughtiness, who are not easily manipulated or flattered, who are comfortable being themselves, yet not full of vanity, who know they are loved and yet not smug. In short, we are responsible to raise the next generation of Christians. So I have, I have five points of application this morning. These are kind of practical helps. Let me just say, and, and there's so many people gone today, I wish I, I wish I could pay them the same compliment. They, maybe they'll watch the video. I'm utterly encouraged by the families, the young families that we have in our church. Guys, keep doing it. Here's some helpful hints from, from the gray-haired one. Number one, be like-minded with your wife. We'll flesh that out. Number two, know your children. Number three, discipline wisely. Number four, teach by word and example. And then number five, pray for your children. So number one, be like-minded with your wife regarding children. So this is big picture stuff. This is formative stuff. And obviously as the father, as the paterfamilias, you have to lead in this. So you wrap your mind around, what are we doing here? Well, this, this family is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Extension of the kingdom. Next generation. Discipline, instruction, instruction, schooling. Men, wash your wives in the word. Go to the word with this stuff. And wives, submit to your husbands. Men, you set the tone in your home. Your, your responses and emotions have much more influence. Now, it's possible to be married to a, a contentious woman. It's in the Proverbs. But in the main, it's the, it's the man who sets the tone, designed to lead his family. And actually, wait till your father gets home is, is fine. <laughs> you know, as Doug Wilson said, 
If a mom says, wait till your father gets home, that disobedient child should see dad's shadow looming in the background. We had a great incident with that. I'll, I'll tell it some other time. It was, it's when I was traveling on the road with the band. It was literally, eh, wait till your father gets home. Huh? In three days. In three days. <laughs> when I got home, it was hugs and kisses. And I think he thought I'd forgotten. And No, we got to come here with me, son. John Bunyan said this, if you want to be a godly head of a family, you must ensure that there is Christian harmony among those under you, appropriate for a house where the leader fears God. So get on the same page. That's, that's easy enough. Number two, know your children. In Psalm 103, the passage we've already read twice this morning, the psalmist states that God knows our frame. He, he knows us inside and out. The implication being that a, a good earthly father has compassion on his children in that same kind of insightful knowledge. This means a good father is not to pile on requirements unsuited to the child until he crumbles. That can be exasperating. That's, that is driving them up the wall. Some people just have to realize that their kids aren't going to be playing for the Colts. And fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Don't drive them up the wall. But, but bring them up in the discipline and admonition of the Lord. That word there, uh, instruction of the Lord, is, is, is well known now, but it's paideia. And we commonly use this word in the, at the end of encyclopedia, paideia. The, the, the Greek term encyclios, or complete circle system. Now we're talking about utter and total worldview. When you get up in the morning, when you rise, and when you walk along the path, you share the word of God with these kids. Bring them up in this, a Christian culture, Christian worldview. And I think, again, this is probably a huge issue in some of the problems we see in the SBC, is that people are just barely getting by on, I think my sins are forgiven, and then they go off and live like the world or think like the world. And they haven't developed a Christian worldview. How, does, how are we to think God's thoughts after him? The text says that fathers are to bring their children up in training and admonition. Bring them up to nourish, to maturity, to nurture. In the best sense of the word. And this can't be done without intelligent, wise oversight of the whole process. See, the goal of child rearing is to bring about kids who love God. I, to be honest, when our kids were growing up and people would ask about, you know, their future plans and college and all that. And I'd be like, yeah, I guess, but my priority is that they fear God, period. I mean, I want them to follow Jesus Christ. So the goal must be in the minds of our parents before it's reached. It's like the hitting, hitting a a target without having a target. You'll hit it every time, but you hit nothing. In fact, part of knowing your children is, is found in Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he won't depart from it. So that kind of intelligent oversight is, is absolutely critical. My son Aaron used to work for Lifeline, the, the boys' home in Pearson. And he, he would come back with just horror stories of teenagers who were just gone. And one of his conclusions was, man, first nine months of a child's life, which happens in here. And then the next thing, absolutely critical. Things can get messed up so badly when, when children are neglected or abused. When they're just babies, people think, well, they won't remember it. Right. And the thing is, you want to start training when they're young, when they're still saplings, not when they're, by the time they're 14, they're kind of oakish, not acornish anymore. Number three, discipline wisely. We're going after obedience from the heart, not just external conformity. The model, I think we're all familiar with it, instead of loose tolerance when the children are little and then clamping down as they get older, Reverse that. 
reverse that. Small children are to live in a benevolent dictatorship because I said so. As they get older, you can begin to explain the rationale. Now, they're still obligated to obey, but the way this works in real life is that when you begin there, then they get more responsibility with corresponding liberty and freedom as they get older. Now, we were, we were absolutely blessed by having an obedient son who then modeled for our two daughters. I remember when, when cell phones <laughs> became ubiquitous, he had a flip top. He would add, they said, I'm going to go see uh, the Hulk or whatever with my friends in Warsaw. And we get a phone call at 930. Hey, is it okay if we go to Arby's for a sandwich? Yeah, well, thank you for call- Yes, yes, do that. Remember, every, every contestant on Bridezilla was once a, a cute little disobedient toddler. You know, start there. And to get really pointed with it, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline. You see, it's not just a willy-nilly hitting at all. It's careful, wise instruction. It's what I appreciated about shop class. There was careful, patient instruction, but don't cross him. (laughs) Same with my dad. Don't cross him in school. You're going to go out and dent a locker with your head. (laughs) And all it takes is one of those, and the rest of the class shapes up really quickly. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. And of course, as I said, the older the children are, the fewer the external restrictions has to be. As a child is being reared properly, experience more adulthood. And Calvin writes this, It's not the will of God that parents in the exercise of kindness should spare and corrupt their children. Let their conduct toward their children be at once mild and considerate, so as to guide them in the fear of the Lord and correct them when they go astray. That age is so apt to become wanton that it requires Frequent admonition and restraint. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Let's see. I, I see a teenager in here. Well, two. Oh, frequent restraint. <laughs> Number four, teach by word and example. I mentioned earlier, Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. These words I command you today will be on your heart. Teach them diligently to your children And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Some people want to to make that this, this formal, constant formal discipline. I think what what Moses was speaking of is the entire atmosphere, because we're talking about 24-7, when you rise up, when you lie down, when you walk along the way. It permeates everything. Conversations are it's so easy to draw your children into these talks about this is what God is doing. I had an experience uh, last week, and we spent way more time with our family than I thought we were going to, and it was great. And I was in the studio with Liam. Liam's five. His sister's almost three. Liam had the dust buster, and she's over there playing the ham and organ. And they had told him, Liam, go somewhere else with that thing. You know, he wanted to clean. He's just helping out, right? Well, he realized that it had a certain effect on Copeland. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Stop it. Well, Liam, come on. She asked you nicely. He stood there, looked at her, looked right at me, looked at her. Hang on, hang on. Looked at me. I said, Liam. I, I just said his name. So I'm working on my computer. I look back, and he's got tears down his eyes. I'm like, Liam. I forget to think of others. <laughs> I feel like Fred Sanford for a second there, you know. Hey, this is the big one. So I sat him on my knee. I said, Liam, so do I. This is why we must confess. This is why we need Jesus. So, you know, his five-year-old mind. And uh, that's okay. Great. Great opportunity. Take those. Take those opportunities. Thomas Watson, on his treatise on the Fifth Commandment, says, Children are young plants. You must be continually watering with good instruction. And of course, if you want to teach by example, 
Fathers, you're it. Man, you are it. Your, your children are watching constantly. What you do speaks as loudly as what you say. Set, set the example in the home for when you sin, it's my sin. That's funny. Amy said, yeah, well, you drove me to it. It may be true. That woman you gave me, that kid you gave me. Exemplify what repentance looks like. Proverbs are full of this. You know, good and bad instruction. Accept my words. Store up my commands. You will understand the fear of the Lord. Don't forget my teaching. Keep my commands. Listen to your father's instruction. Pay attention to your mother's teaching. Even negative ones. It's, it's perfectly legitimate to use negative examples. One time in a Bible study, we said, let's, let's think of those things that we learn negatively. Don't repeat. And again, Thomas Watson, when your children are growing up, put them to some lawful calling. Let them serve others. It's good to consult the natural genius and inclination of the child. Well, that goes to knowing your child. So let me, let me close this. I got, I've got some more here. But look, again, you're doing, you're doing great. Do so all the more. Pray for your children. You notice I have A.W. Pink in the, in the bulletin, the thought for the week, quote for the week. <clears throat> He's got a quote here, and I think it's just brilliant. It says, the last and most important duty respecting both the temporal and spiritual good of your children is fervent supplication to God for them. Without this, all the rest will be ineffectual. Means are unavailing unless the Lord blesses them. Amen. The throne of grace is to be earnestly implored so that your efforts to bring up your children for God may be crowned with success. True, there may be a humble submission to his sovereign will, a bowing before the truth of election. On the other hand, it is the privilege of faith to lay hold of the divine promises and to remember that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Of holy Job, it is recorded concerning his sons and daughters that he, quote, rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. A prayerful atmosphere should pervade the home and be breathed by all who share it. You want, you want to stop the mouths of the obstreperous? <laughs> that's, that's another Calvin word. But those who say smash the patriarchy, Right? Be a good patriarch. Be, model what God has intended. Model, for, in your own home, model it. So your, your children can say, yeah, my dad, with a, like the way I speak about my dad, my dad. Yeah, imperfect, right. Probably should have been a little more assertive. Whatever, he did his best, and I love him for it. And I'm, I'm grateful to have a father. Some of you didn't have such good fathers, but that's what Christ is in the business of, redeeming. Psalm says he sets the fatherless in families. He puts some of you in situations where your, your own earthly failure of a father doesn't define you. It's your heavenly father, and so you grow in grace. And yet you still can honor your father and mother. Be a good patriarch. Let your household be an example of a blessed patriarch. How blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Amen. All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so delighted to call you Father. And it gives us pain to think of those whose whose attitudes have been uh, ruined and corrupted by bad examples. And yet, Lord, you've, you've set the fatherless in families. I pray for all of the fathers this morning and those who, who surround them, those who they are responsible for. Help us as a church to encourage one another to grow in these good things, so that your name would not be blasphemed among the nations. And as your kingdom continues to expand in the world, I pray that our families will be integral parts of this. We thank you and we love you. And we give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen.